Well, it's getting towards the end of these letters here, and I decided that this is going to be the second to last one. As you may already know, I've got a kid to adopt and a friend to spend time with, so my hands are a bit full. I want to wrap things up with you guys, so I'm putting these last two letters together with the best of my ability, even though it's taking a bit longer than usual. So sorry about any time gaps here, but I want to make sure I don't give you guys a lazy or half-hearted account of my experiences. Alright, so with that, we can begin as usual with the regular short Q&A section. I'll only be doing a few questions this time since I blew through so many in the previous letter, but I'll be on the lookout for more for the last letter. So if you ask them, I may get to them there. Let's get into it. Someone said that they got an idea that cryptids had been exterminated from Europe. I'm not sure where they got that impression, but that couldn't be farther from the truth. As I've said many times before, monsters are everywhere, and there are just as many in Europe as anywhere else. Europe has plenty of big cities where you can find fairies, vampires, and more, and plenty of wilderness areas where you can find thriving populations of trolls, almas, kushedra, and more. On top of this, although the Hunters as an organization have been responsible for at least partially driving a cryptid species to extinction a very few times, Yes, this has only been in distant times, and certainly never on the scale of an entire continent. That's simply not our goal, and in fact, it runs quite counter to our mission, at least nowadays. Am I sending these letters in as physical paper letters? <laughs> Goodness no, I'm old-fashioned, but not that old-fashioned. I send these in via email, but as I may have mentioned before, I have essentially hijacked my nephew's email for this purpose because I don't have one that I really use. Don't laugh at me. Can monsters be imagined into reality? This is a concept known as tulpa, where something can be thought or imagined into being. The way we think about this idea today is a relatively new philosophy, but there's a decent amount of research that has been done into it. None of it shows that tulpas can be manifested into physical reality like this. However, people are genuinely affected by making efforts to do so. For my part, I highly doubt that any sort of literal monsters can be created just by imagining or thinking them up. I'm not going to flat out say no because anything is theoretically possible, but there's no evidence for it. They can be as real as you want in your mind, though, and isn't that also worth it in the end? Why do cryptids seem to be unable to get into houses? This is a great question with an answer that's weird and unclear. There are countless stories of people running into monsters that don't break through doors or windows. For some reason, even though physically speaking, they could do so very easily, there are a lot of different theories as to why this happens, but as usual, I tend to lean towards the simpler ones. I personally think the main thing is that many creatures, cryptids included, are pretty thrown off by man-made structures and objects. It's very rare for any animal to willingly enter buildings unless they're familiar with them. It's an unknown space that's known as the den of humans, which can be dangerous creatures when armed. Besides, most monsters don't necessarily want to kill you as much as run you off. So if you leave the area and go inside, then they probably feel that they've accomplished that goal. There's really no reason to break into an unknown structure unless it's truly worth the effort, which it doesn't really seem to be most of the time. I can't think of any reasons besides seriously wanting to kill someone that a monster would break into a building to go after them. And even then, there are very few monsters that would ever actually want in that badly. It just doesn't seem worth the effort or the potential danger. This is also why cryptids and larger animals hardly ever break into people's houses for food or shelter unless they're desperate. Humans are more vulnerable when we're alone and away from our dens, so to speak. But it's a different story when we're indoors and potentially have other people and weapons. That's why I'm a big advocate for traveling in groups. So that's my best guess as to why monsters don't really break into houses. Although the real reason may be something totally different. For certain cryptids like fairies though, you can safeguard a house by ringing it with salt or iron. Or by putting these materials around doorways, chimneys, windows, and other entry points. I think I mentioned that Heather's family in Ireland has to do this every so often, so when their farmstead has been haunted by different malevolent or dangerous fairies and other things, they are protected. 
Space werewolves from the future. I don't know where to begin with this. It's so ridiculous that it's scary. What would an alien werewolf even look like? Why would they have to be aliens at all? I'm thinking something with lasers. I think the werewolves from our Earth and the present day are quite enough already. Do I believe in spirits? There are two interpretations of the word spirit that I can think of here. There are spirits of the dead, as in dead humans or potentially other beings, and then there are non-human spirits, as in entities that are something else entirely. I certainly believe in the former, and I think that the latter are real as well, although I'm much less certain about their nature. I think the spirits of the dead are still with us, although maybe not every single one of them. A couple of charms I wear are specifically intended to solicit help and guidance from those who came before me. As for other inhuman spirit entities, I believe in them as well, but I don't entirely know what they're like. I think that there are spirits like animals and plants out there because I believe that all living things have a spirit, and I think that there are higher powers in the universe than we can fully understand. I can't say entirely what those powers are though. So I said this was going to be a quick Q&A, so we're almost done here. To wrap up, let's quickly go over some info about specific cryptids that people have asked about. Both are endemic to Alaska, as in native to the state, and found nowhere else. Like other Alaskan monsters, each is unique and mysterious in its own way. First up is the Kustaka, sometimes known as Otterman. These are like other cryptids that I have discussed previously, including fairies and the little people. They are known to few subarctic Indian groups, mainly the Klinkit. Kustaka are shapeshifters with two forms, that of a human and that of an otter. There are two regional variants of these subspecies, coastal and inland, aka ocean and river. The former has the sea otter as their otter form, and the latter has the river otter as theirs. They can shift between these shapes at will, although even in their human forms, they will still have strangely otter-like eyes and longer, fur-like hair on different parts of their body. They are talented mimics and illusionists, able to imitate human voices and even project limited images to people of their choosing. Kustaka are fickle, and some are aggressive while others are more benevolent. They are notorious for luring people into rivers and the sea with voices or images of loved ones, and for killing or attempting to kill them afterward. But others have been known to save people from freezing to death in the wilderness or from drowning. Although they do this by carrying them to safety, and don't go so far to return them to their homes or families. It's sometimes said that Kustaka will save people by transforming them into otters or fellow Kustaka. And this certainly seems to be the case, because some people have reported seeing missing loved ones in the form of these otter men. They're very strange, and since they're not always malevolent, hunters don't really fight them or kill them regularly. When certain individuals become a problem, that's when we'll take more severe measures. But it's not easy to hunt an intelligent creature that can become a small, highly mobile aquatic animal. And so typically, it's best to set a trap or help people to keep aware to protect themselves. Last is the Wahila. Now, this is another semi-predatory Alaskan monster. The name Wahila is actually an invention by a white cryptozoologist. But, like other similar names, it's caught on so much that now the hunters use it as well. We sometimes also call them razor wolves. Wahila is a huge white wolf, resembling much larger versions of the arctic gray wolves that mainstream science recognizes. Unlike gray wolves, they are solitary and in terms of ecology and lifestyle, Wahila really resemble big cats or bears more than social canines they are more genetically related to. Wahila prefers thick timber and tree cover and roams isolated valleys and hills in Alaska and northwest Canada. Some people believe that they have a spiritual quality to them because they rarely are sighted and seem to carry an aura of almost supernatural majesty. It's not entirely known how common Wahila is, but they appear to be quite rare, and when they attack people, it's usually in self-defense. Some have become unusually aggressive and started to range further and further into more populated areas. But generally, razor wolves keep to themselves and aren't much of a danger to humans. Alright, so that's it for the Q&A, 
and now I'm going to turn your attention to a place that's a whole lot hotter. For this letter, I will tell you about my hunt that I went on for the Dinganek, another rare and mysterious monster. I realized that in this second round of letters, I've been telling you guys more than the first round about when I encountered strange and more unique cryptids, and the Dingonek fits the description very well. As always, I'll start by telling you about the monster itself, then about the time I had to deal with it. The name, Dingonek, like the word Wendigo, deer, or salmon, is both the singular and plural version of the word. There's no S's at the end when there's more than one. So it's one Dinganek, four Dinganek, etc. The name comes from the Maasai and Kikuyu, peoples of Kenya and Tanzania, who used to have a few other terms to refer to the creature as well. Once again, I find myself having a hard time describing the appearance of a cryptid, but here's the best I can do. Dingonek honestly look like dinosaurs in a lot of ways and a bit like bunyips if you heard my letter on that. So, that might help you get a better picture. They are huge with long bodies, at least 10 feet long, not including the tail, which can add up to another eight feet on top of that. So in total, from nose tip to tail tip, full grown dinga neck are usually about 15 feet long, with most being a good deal bigger than that. They have four shortish legs, a bit like crocodiles, just proportionally a bit longer and not set quite as far out to the sides. Each leg ends in a paw and these have short claws that are a bit sharper and more curved than crocodilian claws. Dingonek have long necks at least a couple of feet in length ending in boxy almost cat-like heads. Also, like some extinct cats, Dingonek have pair of long, slightly curved canines, which are very much like saber-toothed cats. Between Dingonek and Bunyip, that's two water-dwelling cryptids that have developed these saber teeth. It's a nice example of what's called convergent evolution, where two mostly unrelated creatures evolved separately to have similar traits. However, Bunyips are mammals and Dingonek are reptiles. So, rather than fur, Dingonek Bodies are entirely covered in thick black, gray, green, and brown scales, with bumpy scutes along their back and sides like crocodilians to provide additional protection and armor. These scales are usually slightly mottled with scattered, darker, and lighter patterns, and this coloration provides extra camouflage. Again, Dingonek are reptiles, but unlike most any other reptile, they have little raised bumps on the side of their head providing tiny external ears. Dingonek lives in Eastern Africa, primarily in Kenya and Tanzania, but also range into Uganda and the easternmost reaches of the Congo area. They inhabit waterways of all sorts, but have been most encountered in major bodies like Lake Victoria and large rivers. Ecology-wise, Dingonek has a lifestyle that's like a hybrid between jaguars of South America and crocodiles. They are large, powerful, solitary animals only meeting to mate. Even during mating season, and especially outside of that time, Ngonek are usually hostile towards each other, which is likely one reason why their population is so low in number, like other solitary and reclusive cryptids. They are territorial and have stretches of river or areas of lakes that they defend fiercely. For their diet, it seems to Gunek primarily goes after fish, but the main theory for why they possess their distinctive saber fangs is that they use these teeth to pierce through hide and muscle. Dingonek is one of the few animals that will actively target hippos, and pretty much the only one that routinely goes after crocodiles. Their fangs allow them to punch right through their scales and skin and devastate their prey. But despite their telltale saber teeth, Dingonek are not entirely carnivorous and will feed on a certain river plant or two if they have to. However, their large size and power can make them dangerous to just about anything that crosses their path. This includes watercraft, and a gonek have a disturbing habit of rearing up their tails to come surging out of the water and smashing down onto fishing boats. Very much like the Alaskan Powryuk, that I talked about in my letter where I retold the Namahage account. 
Speaking of that letter, if you've listened to it and or some of my previous ones where I talked about Heather, you may remember that part of her specialties was in researching and dealing with aquatic cryptids. She was very involved in this field, so she frequently got called to many places across the globe to help studies, investigations, or hunts. Her guide, Callum, would also get her all sorts of jobs in different countries and regions where she had some experience. This is one reason why she got called to the Republic of the Congo to deal with Amelatuka. And since we were together, I got to ride in her coattails on a bunch of these tasks. This was how we wound up in Tanzania and then in Kenya. First, I must give you a bit more natural history, which I promise is important to understanding the background of this experience. There is a big river named Mara River that flows from Kenya, south through Tanzania, and then west into Lake Victoria. As I mentioned before, all these water areas are prime Dagonek habitats. It's also prime habitat for a huge variety of other animals. You probably haven't heard of the Maasai Mara, but the name Serengeti might be familiar, and these are two regions through which the Mara River flows. Most of these areas are the classic African savanna you see in documentaries, sparse trees, tall grass, and vast plains that seem to go on forever. It's home to elephants, antelope, zebras, rhinos, hippos, giraffes, and practically all the other big name African wildlife. Every year there's an event called the Great Migration where millions of wildebeest, zebras, gazelles, and other antelope species make a long trek over many months, they follow the rains to find fresh plants and watering holes. As you might imagine, having such a huge concentration of prey animals in one area makes the migration season an absolute field day for predators. Lions, cheetahs, leopards, hyenas, crocodiles, and more are all able to score relatively easy meals by going after herds, particularly the old, weak, and young animals and or the ones that have fallen behind. It brings a ton of animals together in one main area. And so, it's a great time for safaris, tourists, filmmakers, and researchers. There's a lot of life and death that happens during the Great Migration, and everything is competing for resources and survival. During it all, there are rare packs of African wild dogs that can be found. Now, I've spoken briefly about these animals in my letter that included a Namahage account where I told you about a time when I saw a closely related species known as the Ajule while I was in Libya. African wild dogs live to the south of sub-Saharan Africa, and they are a lot like wolves, living in highly social packs. They have beautiful spotted coats and are often called painted dogs because of it. I highly recommend searching Google images of African wild dogs because they have some of the most gorgeous fur patterns in the mammal class and even in the Wild Kingdom overall. They are endangered, with one big reason being that they frequently get outcompeted for prey, and even flat out killed by larger and stronger predators, especially lions. So African wild dogs are a species that benefit from protection from humans, especially in regions where they are becoming increasingly rare. Lions are also vulnerable, and since you might be wondering what could threaten lions besides humans, the answer is Dagonek. The number of herbivores that go on the Great Migration numbers in the millions, and they must cross multiple bodies of water, and the Mara River, on their journey. In and around the water are key spots for predators to strike, and since Dagonek are aquatic, they are very, very good at attacking in these areas. Lions and African wild dogs don't usually go diving entirely into the water, but they often get close to it and this can bring them into contact with Dagonek. In these situations, it rarely goes well for the mammals. This is not to mention that there are safari camps and research bases along the rivers, and the Mara has quite a few of these, mainly in Kenya. There are also groups of Maasai and Kikuyu people who live and travel around some parts of the region. The last thing anyone wants to happen is to be herding their animals on a nice vacation or gathering data and get attacked by a giant, territorial reptile that's bigger than a crocodile, can run quicker than a human on land, and swim even faster in the water, and has a set of saber teeth and a nasty disposition. One summer, Heather's guide, Callum, 
contacted her about a job request that had been put out by a Tanzanian hunter named Benson. He worked in many places across the country, and Tanzania is a big place. Because most maps try to put the spherical shape of the planet onto a flat rectangle, the size of Africa is always distorted. So it's always looked way smaller than it actually is. Tanzania has a bunch of different regions, and Benson spent much of his time around the biggest city in the country, Dar es Salaam. But he also worked further north, and he had contacts among many of the rangers, researchers, and drivers in the Serengeti. During the Great Migration, monsters can show up along with the animals that we're more familiar with, so Benson liked to keep an eye out during this time especially. As it happened, one of the safari drivers that Benson knows got in touch with him to report some unusual events. All the drivers and tour guides, lowercase g, communicate with each other, often sharing info about where the animals are and thus where the good spots to take tourists are. One of the drivers, who we'll call James, reported that while going to pick up a tour group in the early morning, he had found a pair of dead lions near the bank of the Mara River. These were two bachelor males, roaming without pride of their own. It's a rare sight that lions will get killed like this, and especially not two at the same time. James had analyzed the bodies and found that although they'd been partially scavenged, there was enough of the corpses left intact to see that their necks had been slashed. According to James, it could have been possible that a hippo or rhino could have done this, but that was very unlikely for a whole bunch of reasons. James took some pictures and returned to his jeep. He told his other colleagues about what he had found, but nobody could really determine what had happened. And it seems like they mostly decided to chalk it up to unknown circumstances that they couldn't explain. A few days later, while driving along the river to a crossing site for the migration, another tour group had seen something in the water lying on a large rock. It appeared to be almost twice the size of a crocodile apparently basking with the upper two-thirds of its body on the rock and the rest in the water. At the jeep's approach, the creature didn't move, but when the people in the vehicle noticed it and stopped, then the creature calmly slid off the rock and submerged itself into the brown, muddy water. Again, nobody had any idea of what to make of this, and the consensus was that it was just an absurdly large crocodile with a strange neck. Importantly, Nobody connected this sighting to the discovery of the dead lions from before. The third and final bit of strangeness came from when a park ranger was on duty, overseeing a pair of white rhinos. Poaching is an unfortunate reality for species like elephants and rhinoceroses, so in some places, there are armed guards assigned to keep an eye on animals to keep them safe. This guard had been having a normal day when the rhinos he was watching suddenly became spooked. He soon found the cause was a pair of African wild dogs, dead on the ground close to the river, in the exact same fashion as the lions from before. There was a lot of blood, not just from the corpses, and when another park ranger came to examine the bodies, he found that they had been slashed on their backs and necks, much like the lions. There were also deep puncture wounds, far deeper than any standard predator's fangs could have pierced. Again, the incident started making the rounds, and now James, the driver who had discovered the lions, started putting everything together and realized that they were likely dealing with the cryptid. He didn't know anything about the Dagonek, but he made a call to Benson, the hunter, and had him come out to do some investigating. Benson had gone out on foot around the river and found what resembled oversized crocodile or lizard prints. He realized there was indeed a Dagonek out and about killing the predators and he put out the request for assistance. Benson is a great hunter, but water monsters are not his forte. Since the Mara River is such a big area, it would also help to have several people scouring the area. That was when Heather decided to jump in and provide some backup. As she'd been to several areas of Africa before and knew what she was doing when it came to large aquatic cryptids, and as always, I just tagged along with her. So off we went and before long we found ourselves landing in our private plane on a little dirt airfield in the middle of the Serengeti in mid-morning. Again, it was everything you'd see on the postcards. Acacia trees and bushes dotted around here and there, 
blue mountains off on the horizon, and a seemingly endless sea of yellow grass all around. It was almost surreal to be there, and it's so cool to think that one branch of my ancestors and ultimately all of our ancestors came from such a place. Waiting for us on the airstrip was a big green safari style Jeep and Benson himself. He looked mostly like what I'd pictured in my head, although a little shorter and more heavy set, with dark skin and a short haircut that's usually hidden beneath the baseball cap. Interestingly, Benson wears glasses a lot of the time, which as you might imagine is not terribly common for hunters, at least not the research-oriented ones. He also throws on a plaid patterned red and blue cloth known as a shuka, which is a traditional Maasai garment that serves both as a blanket and a piece of clothing, almost like a toga. Welcome to Tanzania, he proclaimed when he stepped out of the plane. Benson isn't really a huge jokester or anything, but he's usually in good spirits. We got out and shook his hands, and somewhat to my amusement, Benson was surprised to hear and see that I was half black, because they don't get a whole lot of black foreigners in Tanzania. He was friendly and welcoming and helped us chuck all of our baggage and gear into the jeep. The car was able to hold five people, but of course it was only three of us for now. The trunk was enormous, and there was also a compartment underneath the jeep, so we had plenty of room to put our things. When we were all loaded up, we hit the road at about 11am to head to our first destination a place along the Mara Riverbank where Benson had recently seen some Dagonek sign. Yup, footprints and drag marks, he told us. Did you take pictures? Was the first thing that Heather and I asked. Benson passed us a cell phone, and although I couldn't exactly remember what model it was, I did write down that it was a Samsung. According to Serena, Samsung has very nice cameras, which was obviously beneficial to us in that instance. Benson's photos were comprehensive and detailed, taken from a variety of angles and included a ruler for scale in some of them. The picture showed some large drag marks which was likely caused by a Dagonek. Benson explained that he hadn't found any remains of prey at this spot, but unlike the other water predators such as crocodiles, Dagonek don't eat their kills in the water, instead they prefer to drag them onto land and sometimes into some bushes or reeds to eat. There was also what Benson guessed would have been a drag mark from the Dagonek's tail visible in the mud. All this sign could have been left by a large crocodile, though the key to the piece that led us to identify this as Dagonek sign was the footprints. There were nine prints visible, but six had been heavily smudged and distorted, leaving only three clear ones. These tracks were strange and unlike anything I had ever seen, almost resembling a cross between those of a feline and those of a crocodile or a lizard. If you've ever seen a paw print of a cat or dog, you'll know how they have multiple dots or blob-like shapes. Each of these is left from one of the pads on the animal's feet. The Dagonek, prints almost appeared to have large pads in the center, and from this branched out into four or five long, thick toes. On a few of the prints, you could even see deeper indents on the tips of the toes where the cryptid's claws have sunken into the earth. Because Benson placed the ruler in a few of the pictures, we could see some rough measurements. It's important to note that the footprints can always be a little distorted depending on the terrain, and especially in soft mud. They can appear bigger than the actual footprint. So, we took the measurements with a sizable grain of salt, but nonetheless, some footprints that were well over a foot and a half long were very interesting to see. It's big, probably more than 20 feet, Benson told us when we asked him about the overall size of the Dagonek. That wasn't great news, but it was also expected. As we rode, we started discussing our approach. Benson explained that he had an inflatable raft stowed away beneath the jeep and we realized that we might have to use it. It wasn't always possible to drive alongside the river, and if we needed to get after the Dagonek in the water, the raft would be pretty much our only option. But the obvious problem was that the Dagonek had saber teeth and claws that could easily puncture a hippo and a crocodile, so I don't know how much a blow-up raft would really help. However, there really wasn't another option. Benson said that there were some small wooden boats, much like canoes, moored at a safari camp a few miles away from the border in Kenya. 
He and his capital G guide, whose name was Moses, had already gotten permission to use these boats beforehand, and Benson had a rack to attach one of them to the jeep. However, because he hadn't had the time to retrieve one before our arrival, we would have to go get it if we needed it. So, if we had to go out on the water, we either had the choice of a wooden boat or an inflatable raft, neither of which sounded like great options against such a massive animal, but they were our only real options for the river. Because this was the dry season as well, the waters were very low, and the larger craft wouldn't be able to get through many stretches of the Mara very well. For that matter, we might have to hop out and even drag our smaller vessels in some of the areas. Ultimately, we decided to see what the situation was and tried tracking the Dagonek from the spot we were headed to just to make any sort of firm decision. The trip to the river took us well into the afternoon. On the way, we saw a bunch of little birds like weavers and rollers, along with about five or six guinea fowl that ran across the road ahead of us. In the distance, at one point, we spotted a herd of about eight elephants, and although I wished we could have stayed to watch them, we had work to do. We passed multiple termite mounds and large trees, and as we got closer to the water, the foliage began to grow greener and thicker. Bushes and shrubs became more common until we had to leave the road entirely. Benson took us off into the tall grass, which is of course what these jeeps are made for, in part. Thankfully, it wasn't as bumpy as I expected, and we only had to off-road for a few minutes before we hopped out of the van. We had to close all the windows and the sunroof because Benson told us most animals aren't scared of human vehicles, and they will enter them if they can. Evidently, the baboons and other monkeys were the worst culprits, and will routinely steal whatever they can grab from the jeeps, which makes sense. After getting out, we walked through the bushes for a couple of minutes up to a steep bank where the earth dropped away to the light brownish water of the Mara River. The opposite side of the river was in a more open, grassy area, while our side was thick with bushes almost right up until the steep embankment, where the land dropped off toward the water. Benson guided our attention to a point along the bank where a large log rested in the mud. He tied a red bandana on a bunch that stuck up from the log to mark the spot. The tracks are just past that log, Benson informed us. Every hunter must be very familiar with the natural world and the particulars of their environment, but this was one of those times where I was amazed by just how well some of us can pick out the smallest details of an area and remember them. Benson has one of the best eyes I have ever seen from our organization, which is crazy because he's wearing glasses half the time. As a matter of fact, in the circles of safari drivers and rangers that he works in, most people have nicknames and code names, usually the names of birds. There's a driver who goes by Secretary, short for Secretary Bird, another who goes by Marshall, short for Marshall Eagle, and so on. Benson's code name is Batulur, a type of eagle that is well known for its incredible vision, which often leads it to be the first bird to find a fresh kill from the air. So by these highly trained and highly experienced guides and trackers who make their living by using their sight to find things are calling Benson by that name, which should give you an idea of how good the guy's eyes are. Anyway, we picked our way carefully down the embankment by using rocks and roots for our foot and handholds, and just by sliding where that wasn't an option. It wasn't too far, so we made it down to the river fairly easily. We walked downstream to where the log was, and further, beyond that, and we came across an area where Benson had taken the photos. Unfortunately, we were all in for a big letdown. By our estimations, probably no more than a half day earlier, probably the previous night, a crocodile had come through the exact same spot where the Dagonek traces had been left. Almost completely wiping them out with its own footprints, drag marks, and dripping water. The only real sign of the Dagonek that was left behind was half of a footprint. It let Heather and I get a first-hand look at what we were dealing with, but of course it was not much of a lead. Well, that sucks, I muttered after we had looked over the scene. At least now we know that other animals are here. The Dagonek couldn't have driven all the crocodiles out of the area if one came here this recently, Heather said. Yes, or maybe they came back precisely because the Dagonek left, Benson said. 
Possibly, if they'd be bold enough to come back so soon. Whatever the reason is, the Dagonek isn't here anymore, Heather said. What would make any crocodiles want to come back to this area rather than just move on to another one? Is there anything particularly worthwhile here? I asked. Hmm. Crocodiles need waters where there is prey. And this area does have some. A pride of lions also lives here, and we know that the Dagonek has killed these animals before, Benson said. What about the migration? Either Heather or I asked. Yes, that's the other thing. We are only a few miles south of the Kenyan border. Further upstream, on the other side of it, there are sites where there could be wildebeest crossing the river, Benson explained. Could the Dagonek be making its way there? I asked. Oh no. I just thought of something that's a bit strange, Benson admitted. Lay it on Heather, told him. Well, records of the Dagonek show that they are very aggressive. They have gone out of their way to kill, even when they do not need to. And the bodies that we've found have not been eaten. And they were all predators. Perhaps the Dagonek is hunting down its competition, Benson said. You mean it's actively targeting predators like lions? I asked. I had heard of such a thing, but rarely. Other cryptids like Dogman or Wampus cats will do this, but it's not very common. I suppose it's possible, Heather said. But I wonder why it would do that during a season like the migration. There's so much prey to go around, so the competition would be much less right now, I asked. Well, perhaps this Dagonek has learned more than the others in the past. It might know the rival predator species are more likely to be closer together along the migration route. It will be easier to find them now. Another problem is that now humans are going to be here in great numbers as well. This is when the tourists come, Benson said. I kid you not when I tell you that I remember getting chills at this moment, because this was a disturbingly likely idea. That's right, deadly and not in a good way, Heather whispered. Until now, it seemed like the monster would still be in this area. I was hoping for that, and probably tricking myself into believing it. But now, we know that it's gone. I should have thought of this earlier, Benson muttered, and I could tell that he was beating himself up a little. Hey, you had no idea so let's work with it. This is your turf, Benson. Where do you think we should start? I asked him. Maybe it's the whole glasses equal intelligence stereotype, but I vividly recall practically seeing the gears turning in Benson's head as he thought. I think we need to go north and cross into Kenya. The boats are at the safari camp close to the border. We can get one there and use it to go on the river if we need to. I'll go on my radio and ask about the migration crossing points. With any luck, we may find the Dagonek around one of these spots, Benson said. It seemed like a good idea, so we set out. I should note that we are damn lucky to have this whole great migration situation taking place. Yes, it had probably contributed to this activity from the Dagonek, but it also gave us a good way to potentially locate it. With our game plan set up, we started to drive north. The safari camp where we needed to go was only about 20 miles away, but the dirt roads in many national parks and reserves can be bumpy and winding, so the journey took a bit longer than it might otherwise. Eventually, we crossed the border at a little checkpoint along the fence line, which was just a small station building with a pair of men overseeing it. They knew Benson to be trustworthy, so they let us pass without any problems. A bit more driving took us to some more termite mounds and trees, and this is where we began to see the herds of animals that had already made the crossing. At one point, we briefly paused because along the horizon were hundreds of wildebeest, accompanied by only a fewer zebras and gazelles, all of them grunting and walking and eating and tossing their heads, covering the grassland almost as far as the eye could see. It was incredible to witness partly because I had never seen so many animals at once, except on TV. Heather and I couldn't stop staring and smiling, and Benson just chuckled. I don't often get to see people's reactions to this, but it's always a pleasure when I do he said. I wish we could have stayed longer, but we had a job to do, so we kept driving and moved on. There were smaller, scattered groups of antelope and zebras everywhere, a sign of a healthy population and a hint that there had been predators in the area. As the afternoon went on, we came to the safari camp where we needed to be. Benson explained that it was a mobile camp, so there were only a few permanent buildings. Mostly, there were just a lot of big and fancy tents made of canvas, set up for tourists. 
There was also a restaurant, bathrooms, and a couple of lounges. But we continued past all of these and down to a pathway, lined by a wooden railing along the river. The pathway was several feet above the water, but Benson took us down a set of stairs and went a bit further down into a gazebo-like structure, presumably where people could stand and view the water and the wildlife. We were still a good deal above the river, but we ducked under the railing of the gazebo and made our way down to the water's edge, where there were three wooden canoe-like boats, just as Benson told us. These are our rides. We can take any of them we want, Benson said. The boats were big, so they would have certainly held all of us and a good amount of our gear. We only needed one, so we looked over them to see which one seemed the sturdiest. All of them were in good condition and appeared around the same terms of build quality. One was painted green, another blue, and the last one was red. What's your favorite color? Heather asked Benson. He chuckled and played along. Let's say red. Also sticks out more against the landscape, Benson said. With that, we took the red boat, hauled it back through the camp and on to the top of our jeep. We naturally got a few odd looks from some of the tourists and rangers, and one of the safari guides ran up to Benson and started talking to him in Swahili. There was no tension in the conversation, and eventually the other man seemed content with what Benson told him and went away. Benson said that he was just asking where we were planning on going, and that he had answered truthfully, saying that we were probably heading towards the migration site. The safari guide had given him some good info, saying that there was likely going to be a crossing in the next few days at a point further upstream, so that was where we would head. Luckily, we could get most of the way there by driving, so we didn't have to go boating just yet. To say it again, foliage and wildlife habitat makes it basically impossible to drive directly alongside the Mara for much of its length, so if we had to progress at certain points, we would be forced to take the water. When we got back to the jeep, it was late in the afternoon, so we ate lunch as Benson got on his radio and satellite phone and started making calls. It sounded like he was talking to about five or six different people, and eventually he told us that crossings were happening at a few different spots. With millions of animals, there are many individual routes and time frames along the overall migration track and how they take it. There had been a crossing two days earlier at a spot a few miles upstream of the camp, where we were, and the site that the guide at the camp had told Benson about was only about a mile or two in the same direction, so closer to us. The spot further away was larger and more heavily trafficked by humans as well as animals, because it has plenty of room for many jeeps to view the proceedings. The closer spot was set amongst a little patch of woodland, meaning that it wouldn't really be visible by any jeeps. Which one do you think the Dagonek would hang around? I asked because the other two were the experts here. I'm thinking the farther one, more animals mean more prey and more predators, if the Dagonek is really going after them, Heather said. Your reasoning is right, Heather, but I'm not sure about the result. We almost never see Dagonek, which means they're stealthy and likely stay away from vehicles and humans. The farther spot has both, downstream would have a little to none, Benson said. Then it comes down to a matter of priority. What's more important to the Dagonek? Killing off potential rivals and scoring prey, or staying hidden from potential predators like us, I thought out loud. Benson, what's the hunting situation like here? Do humans do much hunting here? Heather asked. No, usually not legally. Kenya doesn't allow hunting like that, but it is possible for people to chase prey over the border from Tanzania. There are also poachers sometimes, and the local Maasai and Samburu people may kill animals as well, Benson answered. But Tanzania does not allow hunting, you said, we asked. Yes, much more than Kenya. Many people go hunting for trophies there, so much would think the Dagonek know of this and would be afraid of it, Benson said. We had to talk it over for a while, but eventually we decided just to go to both spots and check for signs and try to get some sort of information further on this. By this time, it was getting well into the evening and although you obviously can drive in the dark, it's not always a great idea especially on a savanna teeming with large animals that could run up into your car. So, we decided just to camp out beside the safari camp and get going in the morning. After setting up camp, we had to be very careful with our stove. We couldn't light a traditional campfire because everything is just so dry and it's very easy for bushfires to go off. Benson said that the rangers do start some controlled fires in parts of the area on occasion to clear away fertile ground, but we obviously weren't rangers. 
That night, I had to shoo a pair of jackals away from our camp after coming back from the bathroom, and from somewhere across the river we heard a bass roar of a lion echo out a couple of times. Hippos also started wheezing and honking from somewhere downstream, and Heather and I made a quick trip to there to go see them. Looking down from the high bank past the railing, we saw about 14 black shapes in the moonlight, floating in the water and walking on the opposite bank. When we turned on our headlamps, the hippos' eyes all glowed red, which was very eerie, and they all started to freak out, grunting and snorting and splashing. We decided not to bother them anymore, so we turned off our so we turned off our lights and headed back to camp. That night and into the next morning, we had our first setback, but it was a pretty big one. Heather developed a fever essentially overnight, and by the time the sun was coming up, she was in bad shape. We had gotten our vaccines and our malaria medication before the trip, but there's always the chance that you can get sick despite all of that. So unfortunately, Heather's Irish immune system decided that it wasn't happy to be south of the equator, and she got very sick very fast. Fever, chills, sweating, all the good stuff. It was really upsetting, but there was nothing that I could do to help her except get her help. We were lucky that we were by the safari camp because there were plenty of staff and guides there that were able to give us a hand. The nearest hospital was a good distance away, but Benton said that Heather probably had malaria and that she'd probably be okay until she made it there. Of course, I was worried as hell, but Heather was able to keep calm and, as usual, reassure me that she was going to be fine and that I could help her by focusing on the job in her place. Benson was able to call in one of his colleagues, a nice tour driver who was off duty, and he took Heather to go off to the hospital. That left just us two guys behind, and I suddenly found myself a lot less confident. I wasn't entirely dependent on Heather, and the both of us did work on some task alone even while we were in the relationship, but not having her around definitely gave me some sort of negative impact at least on the psychological and emotional front. Bro, you must leave her. She'll be okay. Trust me, Benson told me as we watched the jeep with Heather pull off into the grassland. Benson is quite a bit younger than me, but he loves that word, bro. And although I can't remember if he used it exactly at that moment, he probably did, and it always cheers me up a little. I know, I know. Let's get back to business, as she wants us to. I responded. The first thing on the menu was to start scouting out the crossing sites that we had identified. Naturally, we went to the closest spot first, which was the one that was amongst the patch of woodland, inaccessible from a jeep. We would scope out that spot on foot first, then, if necessary, we would come back with a boat to make sure that further surveys were done out on the water. On the drive to that spot, our animal sightings continued non-stop. Practically every tree seemed like it held a fish eagle, pink or blue roller birds, and the nest of weaver birds or hammer cops, or a troop of vervet monkeys. We also caught sight of a group of over 10 ostriches lying around in the dust, as well as a group of giraffes under some trees in the far distance. As we got near our destination, an enormous bull elephant went walking quickly across the road ahead of us, his lower half covered in dark mud and water showing us that we were on the right track. Eventually, we pulled from the road and exited the jeep to continue on foot as planned. For the next long while, well into the afternoon, we swept the area up and down, combing for any sign we could find. Remember how I said that sometimes we don't get leads on hunts for a long time? Well, this was one of those. For three days, Benson and I went up and down the Mara sometimes in the boat and sometimes on foot or in the jeep, prowling sight after sight for any trace of the Dagonac. Heather was taking some time to recover because she was still feeling awful, but she got to stay in a super ritzy hotel in Mombasa, so at least she wasn't sick out in the bushes, I guess. Meanwhile, Benton and I were slogging through the mud and dead reeds, watching out for crocodiles, hippos, snakes, and any other dangerous animals of which there are many. We had a false alarm at one point when a ranger said that they saw something, but it turned out just to be a crocodile. I say just, but apparently this one was around 13 feet long and not as big as an adult Dagonac, but a real whopper for a crocodile. But the breakthrough came when we were boating, and Benson spotted something on the shore. What is that? he asked, 
I looked around and could see nothing but grass, trees, water, and earth. What is what? I asked him in confusion. That, that right there, bro, looks like a dung midden, Benson said. I was behind him on the boat, so I saw him pointing off to our left. The bank was high and steep there, which was part of the reason why we were boating, so we could get closer views to the water and any sign like that which Benson had just found. For those of you who may not know, a midden is also called a latrine. It's basically a communal toilet spot for a group of animals like antelope or chupacabras. It seemed a little peculiar that there would be one below such a steep ridge and so close to the water, so it merited a closer look. We paddled to the shore and dragged the boat up onto the mud, then grabbed our guns and went up to the midden. I should warn you that the next part of this was gross, even for a hunter like me, and I've got to give some of the graphic details to fully explain things. So if you're eating, or just don't like hearing about poop, then this is your warning to skip ahead a few seconds. If you're still here, then props to you. Now let me get on with it. The pile of scat was very tall and broad, maybe about two and a half feet long, and maybe a half a foot high. As Benson and I approached, we saw and heard flies buzzing around, indicating that it was probably somewhat fresh. The exterior was visibly hardened somewhat, but the strange thing was the color. Normally, when most scat is left out for a while, it darkens and becomes almost black rather than brown. But upon getting a closer look at this dung, there was a grayish coloration to the dung. I had seen this before and so had Benson. Hilariously enough, almost at the same time, we both gave a simultaneous cry of, Oh, followed by a certain four-letter synonym for poop, with neither of us intending to be ironic. Naturally, this made us laugh a bit, but our find was still the most important thing here. This scat is almost white. This happens with hyenas, Benson commented. I've heard, yeah. Also happens with dogmen sometimes, I replied. Poop can change colors depending on what's been eaten, of course, but white poop is especially common in predatory or scavenging animals, which can be a sign of high levels of calcium. This large amount of calcium comes from one major source, which is consuming bones. There are not a ton of predators that will eat bones, in any large amount anyway, but hyenas and dogmen are two notable exceptions. But this is no hyena, Benson said, shaking his head. Too big for a crocodile, right? I asked. Definitely, and crocodiles usually excrete their waste in the water. This is no midden. I think this is the Dagonek, Benson said. I was inclined to agree, and there was one way to get the suffice evidence that we need. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, to be a ranger, a scientist, a trapper, a tracker, or a hunter, even without a capital H, you often must do some nasty things. I've never been too squeamish about bodies or waste, and constant exposure to that sort of stuff got me desensitized to it long ago and very quickly. But if you're not willing to deal with it, then those jobs are not for you. So Benson and I donned our trusty gloves and started digging through the feces to see what we could turn up. What we found very quickly led us to believe that the dung was indeed left by the Dagonek. Small remnants of bone fragments could be found here and there, along with a ton of hair. Because there's so many species of animal in the area, it is hard to determine from where the hair came from, but at least some of the fur came from antelope. Once we were finished sifting through the dung, we were confident that this was left by the Dagonek but we had also been so focused on the poop that we hadn't really actively searched for any other sign. That didn't last long because after only a quick look further along the bank, we turned up a clear path. Where there was a tail drag mark and no less than seven to go neck footprints in the mud near the waterline, our days of searching were starting to pay off and Benson and I began to get excited. This can't be that old. Maybe a day and a half, two days most, Benson said. As we assessed our findings further, I obviously didn't know the environment as well as he, but from my own general knowledge and experience, he seemed correct. Agreed. I think we need to radio your friends and ask about any nearby crossings or predator sightings. Do you think the Dagonek has gone far? I asked him. No, not after eating as it has. I'll contact my colleagues and see what the situation is, Benson said. 
We briefly discussed the possibility of setting bait for the Dagonak, in the form of a carcass, but quickly decided that might not be much of a help, given the Dagonek could have moved on, and there were so many other potential targets in the area. We sat on the shore and ate lunch, while Benson made some calls over the radio and satellite phone. He and his colleagues usually spoke almost entirely in Swahili, but after spending so much time around hearing it, I started to pick up on certain code names and phrases. Even though I didn't know entirely what they meant, Benson had been giving me some very basic vocabulary lessons, so I knew a few things like the words for certain animals and the numbers 1 through 10. Sometimes this was enough for me to have a decent guess at what was being said, based on the few words I recognized combined with context clues. So it wasn't too much of a surprise when Benson told me that he was getting news of lion sightings in the area. Looks like there may be a crossing in the next couple of days, a few miles up the river. We should keep an eye on the lions until then. Then we can watch the crossing to see if the Dagonek strikes there, Benson stated. This is exactly what we did. By noon the next day, we had triangulated the location of the lions by communicating with Benson's colleagues, and Benson and I followed them from a long distance away, usually at just several hundred yards. Our concern was not that the lions would get spooked. Like many other national parks and reserves, the animals here are so habituated to vehicles and other stuff like that that they don't really pay them much attention, and they've been known to even climb onto or go inside them. Remember how I had to tell you that we had to close the roof earlier? Instead, we were more conscious of the fact that the Dagonek might be put off by our jeep. We didn't know where or when the cryptid might strike, so we had to be vigilant constantly. The following day was kind of a mess because Benton and I were constantly trying to follow this thing. We were trying to follow a pride of lions. Lions sleep for up to 20 hours a day, so much that this was just us watching and waiting. But at nighttime, when they would move around, we were trailing them as best we could, again at a far distance. This is made harder by the fact that this pride had eight members, and not all of them had always traveled together. Since most of the hunting is done by the lionesses, those were the ones we stuck with for the most part. But of course, the roads and terrain also don't allow us to go everywhere we want, so sometimes we would have to search for them again, and that could be a hassle. Both Benson and I are used to pulling all-nighters, so we were alternating sleeping, driving, and keeping watch. Unfortunately, we had no idea whether Dagonek was nocturnal, so we really had to base our schedule around that. Around 2 in the morning the day after we located the lions, I was asleep in the shotgun seat of the jeep when I was woken up by the low roar of a male lion. If you don't know what that sounds like, I recommend looking it up because it's not what it usually gets portrayed as in the movies. It's much more like a groan than a stereotypical roar. Most hunters are light sleepers largely out of necessity, and I'm no different, so this noise had me awake instantly. We had the illumination of a half moon to see by, but Benson didn't immediately turn on our lights. He was armed with a fancy pair of night vision binoculars and using them, gazing around out the windshield. I also looked out the windshield into the darkness but couldn't make out much besides the vague movement of grass and the wind in the shadow of a rock formation known as Kopi in the distance. There's essentially no light pollution out here, so the stars overhead can be brilliant, and seeing the Milky Way is not uncommon. This also gave a bit of light against the horizon, and although I knew Benson would tell me if he saw anything, I still wanted to look for myself. Eventually, we saw the dark silhouette of a big male lion, the leader of the pride, get on top of a rock, shaking his mane and roaring. It's common for lions to do this to advertise their presence in their territory, but tonight, Benton and I were on high alert, suspecting that this was a display to be aimed at more than just other lions. Our suspicions were confirmed when there was a deep bass rumble from somewhere nearby. Although it was hard to tell the direction, to me, it sounded very similar to the bellow of an alligator. I've also compared to the sound made to the huge dragon cryptid known as Allah. This wasn't as loud as the Allah must be, but of course, it was still powerful, and I could even feel its vibration in my chest very slightly. It almost sounded like the engine of my truck idling, and just as much force, so whatever was making the sound had to have been big and powerful. Of course, it was the Dagonek, 
but we couldn't see it. We were about half a mile away from the river, so the monster had clearly gone out of its way to get here. It looked like our theory about it hunting other predators may have been very well correct. Benson and I grabbed our guns and opened the huge sunroof to look out from the top of the jeep. I see something off by the kopi, Benson said. The kopi was considerably farther away than the rock that the male lion was standing on, but now the lion had stopped roaring. What's the male lion doing? And where are the others? I asked, still unable to see much of anything. Wait, wait, damn, bro, there it is. My god, it's huge. Benson said, hissing a whisper so that he wouldn't be heard. I desperately wanted to see it, but I had a feeling Benson wasn't going to abandon the binoculars now that we had gotten our first sighting of our target. Damn it, Benson, tell me what's happening. I hissed to him. Sorry, sorry, bro. The Dagonek just walked past this side of the Kopi. It's big, and it's very big, but it can hide very well in the grass by crouching down, like big cats do. I can barely see it now, and it's far away. The big lion is off the rock now, disappeared into the grass, but I still see some others creeping up. A bunch of the females. They're very on guard, of course. They're standing still. I can't see the Dagonek anymore. I don't know where it's gone, Benson narrated. Things were quiet for maybe a minute or two with Benson passing me the binoculars. I could just barely see the lions lurking in the grass, and only because of our elevated post on the jeep. There was no sign of the Dagonek, and of course I had just handed the binoculars back to Benson when I heard the rumble again. The grass started rustling violently, presumably as all the lions erupted into movement. Benson said something like, whoa, and I raised my rifle thinking that something was about to happen. Benson didn't say anything else, or at least I couldn't hear it if he did, because all of the lions were snarling before long, something, I assumed the Dagonek made a loud, rattling call, and then there was just the sound of grass rustling before everything went silent. After a moment, Benson handed me the binoculars and dropped down into the driver's seat, speaking a million miles a minute. The lions pushed the Dagonek back. It ran off towards our 11 o'clock. I'm going to try to follow it, and I need your help looking out for it. Turn the spotlight on, Benson said quickly, getting the jeep in gear and gunning it. Benson had a spotlight mounted on the top of the jeep, and thankfully it was standard stuff, so I had no trouble turning it on and off, aiming it in the direction he told me. At first, I saw nothing, but as we sped forward, I caught the sight of thick, greenish-gray tail swinging away in the grass. I called it out and raised my rifle as we approached. I saw a shadow move just out of the beam in the spotlight into some bushes. It was thick bush, but we weren't going to be able to get in there with the jeep, so we stopped just short of the foliage. Do we go in on foot? I asked Benson, letting him make the call. I'm not sure that's a good idea. We've already pressed it a lot and it will be tough to catch it now that it knows we're onto it. We run the risk of pushing after it so much that it won't return. I think we should back off, Benson said. It didn't feel right to have to pull back after getting so close for the first time, but we both hoped that there would be more opportunities. The crossing was likely going to happen later that day, probably quite near to our current location, and that could be our next best chance to catch the Dagonek. We hadn't set bait earlier, but this might serve the same purpose. And this night hadn't been a total wash. Now we knew for sure that the Dagonek was indeed here. Benson had also gotten a look at it, and I had some vague idea of its coloration. We also were now entirely positive that it was coming into conflict with the local predators. It was lucky that these lions had pretty much their entire pride to protect them because I believe numbers were the only thing that saved them from the Dagonek. After all, this cryptid had taken at least a pair of African dogs and a pair of male lions, and still came out on top. Even scarier was the fact that there was no indication of the Dagonek slowing down. The initial killings and now this incident had all happened within less than three weeks, which may seem like a long time, but it's quite quick in the grand scheme of things. And practically, in the blink of an eye when it comes to a predator on predator conflict. The rest of the night was uneventful with Benson and I going back to alternating turns between watching and sleeping. We drove a bit along the riverside as the sky began to lighten, but there was no sign of the Dagonek that we could see from the jeep at least. Soon after the horizon began to brighten, Benson received a transmission on the radio with some good news. A huge group of wildebeest and zebra had been spotted near the Mara, and there was a strong possibility that they might make a crossing soon. 
That was our signal that it was go time, and Benson put out a PSA with his capital G guide, Moses, and all his ranger and safari guide colleagues. It turns out that he had already formed a plan to signal for all the other jeeps and tour groups and rangers in the area to back off from our position and leave us alone. Benson told me that the phrase to signal this was the code name Operation Scale, presumably in reference to the scales of the Dagonak. As I've said before, these guys love using code names, not just for each other, but also for things like animals. These names for different animals are usually based on physical characteristics. For example, the code name for cheetah in Swahili is ground spots, since they have spots and move on the ground, and leopard is tree spots, since they have spots and love to climb. The guides and rangers even have cool little sign language hand signals to visually communicate these turns with each other from a distance without using the radio. Using these personal and animal code names is all in good fun, but it has dual purpose. Not only is it handy for identification purposes, but it also serves to keep information secret or as a surprise to tourists and guests who might have learned the actual Swahili words for certain animals and might recognize them over the radio. We were trying to keep things secret by using the code name Operation Scale. It was one of those if you know you know sort of things, but I sincerely doubt that many people if any besides Benson, Moses, and myself knew. I've always wondered how much the people helping the hunters keep things secret really know what or why they're keeping a secret. I figure everyone just knew to back off when they heard the phrase. Also, for the record, let it be known that I wanted a different code name like Operation Fang or Operation Sabertooth because I thought it would sound cool and Heather wasn't there to tell me to stop being a goof. Unfortunately, this wasn't in the cards because Benson had come up with the code name long before I had ever arrived. And of course, we were trying to keep things relatively low-key. Alas, oh well. Anyway, after Benson put out the message, we hit the road, or the grass, as it were. On the way, we scarfed down a hasty breakfast. Between this and all the previous days we had been in the jeep, unable to make a proper ground camp, we were chewing into our stores of food that didn't need to be cooked. So, that was just one more reason why we were really hoping that this time would be it. We went speeding across the savanna, and if our tires left flames behind us like cartoons, then we would have set the entire place on fire, like a, like a torch. Okay, I'm exaggerating because we maybe hit 45 an hour's max, but that's still very fast for off-roading through the bush. At that pace, it took us no time before we found the animals we were looking for. Hundreds of wildebeest, zebras, and everything else covered the plains, all starting to awaken and stand up nibbling at what little edible vegetation there was. By the time the sun had fully crested the horizon, the herds were beginning to get on the move. Some animals were moving alone, other in pairs or trios, and many more as small groups or larger individual herds. The wildebeest took the lead and Benson explained that this was always the case. Wildebeest seemed to be able to sense the trajectory of the range and act as guides for the rest of the animals over the course of the migration. We drove just ahead of the wildebeest leading the journey, and as we began to near the water, we went away and pulled further towards the riverbank. We were guided there by a swirling pillar of 25 to 30 vultures who were already circling high above the river, waiting for a meal. Animals frequently drown during the crossings, especially the young, old, sick, or injured, and oftentimes crocodiles practically swarm the crossing sites, and hopefully our Dagonek would show up there as well. To set the scene up a bit, our side of the Mara was scattered with bushes and dry reeds blocking the view behind us. The ground here gently sloped down towards the river. There was a clear trail of worn down earth where countless hooves from previous migrants had packed down the earth all the way down to the water's edge. The river was narrow here, maybe 35 or 40 feet across. The opposite bank rose more steeply, but farther upstream at the base of the embankment was a flatter area of earth. On this piece of land, there were nine hippos and three fat crocodiles, almost as roly-poly as the hippos from all the migrating prey they had managed to snag. Now that they were here, we surveyed the scene before making our plan. I think we should split up. One of us goes into the hunting blind, upstream of the crossing path, and the other takes the boat downstream. That way, we'll have a good and different view of the Dagonek, and can cover shots for each other. Benson said. I did not like the sound of that. We knew firsthand that the Dagonek would run from jeeps, 
but all of the Dagonic accounts that involved watercraft spoke about how these cryptids would actively go towards the boats and attack them. No, no way. We can't just take a boat in there with a Dagonek, so likely to be in the water. Before it was a lot different, but now that we know it's here for sure, I mean, you know the stories, I protested. Yes, it's dangerous, certainly, but it might also be an opportunity. First, we have the wildebeest and zebras that the Dagonek may attack. Then, we also have the boat that may be another chance to attract it. If it goes after the boat, that will give us the best shot of all, Benson said. As much as I didn't like the plan, he did have a point, and I'm no stranger to taking risk, after all. Okay, then, since you suggested it, why don't you go in the boat? I offered, half-jokingly. Well, I think you're going to have to do that, bro. Benson said hesitantly. What do you mean? I mean, I will if you want, but I believe in you. I'm sure you can handle it, but it's fine if you don't want to. I said, trying to encourage him and not quite picking up what he was on to yet. No, no, bro, Sam, I, I can't swim, Benson said. As usual, I'm retelling the dialogue here to approximate what he said from the best of my memory. So it's rare that the words are exactly what was said. This moment is one of the few exceptions to that rule, because it was so unique. At other times, I would have blurted out a swear word, but when Benson said this, I was just so stunned I lost my voice. Essentially, and it took me a second to respond, stammering when I did. Benson, what? I asked him. Like, I can swim okay, maybe in a pool, I guess, but I don't know about moving water like this, he answered. The stereotype was playing out right in front of me, but more than that, I wondered why Benson hadn't told me this before. Like, on one of the multiple occasions we had been out on the boat together, maybe he wasn't worried about the water being deep in those stretches if he fell in, which was definitely valid. I also didn't know if the water here was deep enough to, to the point that you would even have to swim at all, you know? But in any case, I was so taken aback that I didn't really respond to him directly. Um, okay then, I'll go into the boat, I guess, I said. As we started to get the boat in the hunting blind out of the jeep, I looked at the water, especially at the hippos on the opposite bank. You may have heard me talk about hippos in my letter about the Amelatuka, but in case you haven't heard that or don't know much about these marvelously weird animals, I must talk about them briefly again here. Not just because I like sharing knowledge, but also because hippos actually played a key role in what happened next. Hippos are totally wild, and they're fascinating and frightening in equal measure. They poop in a gross way, they make bizarre sounds, and they run along the riverbed rather than swim. A group of hippos is called a raft or a float. It's kind of silly. People actually don't know about them usually think, oh look, a roly-poly hippopotamus. I want it for Christmas. It's so goofy. Look at its ears wiggling. But that's missing a lot of information. Yes, hippos do look like some alien creature out of Star Trek, but like cryptids, they're from our planet, and like many cryptids, they can be dangerous as hell. First, I mentioned earlier how their eyes glow red when the light shines on them in the dark, and that plus the noises they make are almost demonic, which would be silly if it wasn't so scary. But that's just the beginning. In addition to possessing a mouth that can open to 150 degrees and is armed with a pair of saber teeth that are even longer than the Dagonex, hippos have tough skin that even lion teeth can hardly puncture. Hippos can weigh almost two tons, and despite being nearly 4,000 pounds, they can run as fast as a tractor on land, and even faster than that in the water. In other words, unless you're in a vehicle of some sort, and sometimes even if you are, you're not getting away from a hippo very easily. They're aggressive, temperamental, and territorial, and easily are one of the most dangerous animals on the entire planet. They kill more people than lions, and even the ancient Egyptians considered them one of their top three most dangerous animals. On par with the leopard and crocodile, Dagonek are faster than hippos and are equipped with claws and scaly armor and saber teeth of their own so they can take down hippos much better than anything else besides humans. But there were eight hippos that day on the Mara. That's a small number for a hippo group, but it's seven more than the Dagonak, and eight more than I wanted to deal with. Thankfully, the hippos were all on land, but I made it very clear to Benson that if any of them were as to so much stick a toe in the water, then I was out of there, no questions asked. Wait a minute, I have a better idea. Benson said as we were in the middle of carrying the boat to the water's edge. I'm all ears, 
I told him, sincerely hoping that he was right. Maybe the Dagonek will go after the boat even if we aren't in it, Benson said. This made me wonder how intelligent the monster was, or maybe just how good its vision was. We could try putting something in the boat, maybe something that looks like us, but how do we get it back if we leave the boat out there? I asked. You see, I knew my raft would come in handy. Get something together and put it in the boat. I need to inflate the raft. Benson instructed me. This was a whole new aspect to the plan, so we had to move quickly to get it implemented. We probably had half an hour or less until the herds began arriving. While Benson started blowing up the raft with the help of an air pump that connected to the jeep, I just started digging through our stuff to find something that would be fitting to put into our boat as a lure. I had done similar things before, just not in a boat, so I was able to come up with an idea rather quickly. I had a spare jacket and a safari hat, both of which I could afford to lose. I went to stuff the jacket with some of the foliage from some nearby shrubs, but the acacia bushes were chock full of thorns, which I think I had been expecting but was disappointing nonetheless. Thankfully, closer to the water's edge, I found some pieces of driftwood, which I was able to use to prop up the jacket and the hat, creating the very vague impression of a human figure seated in the boat. Benson and I waited for a few minutes longer while the raft inflated, and when it was finally ready, we started making moves to get onto the water. The hippos and crocodiles were still far off, but since the river was narrow, I had faith that we could get back to shore in enough time if that had changed. I was also still wary that the river might be shallow enough to walk in, at least in theory. There was enough of a current going on that being on foot would be dangerous. In any case, our destination was not far at all. In the midpoint of the river was a cluster of large rocks and wedged in between these was a huge piece of driftwood, probably part of a tree that had washed down river. It looked sturdy, and our idea was to paddle out and tie the boat to the tree if possible. I would go in the boat and Benson in the raft, and when the boat was secured, I'd transfer to the raft, and we would go back. We would be able to paddle against the current for a while, but not forever, so we had to do this fast, especially since we didn't want to spook either the hippos or the migrating animals. Let's go, hurry, I told Benson as we pushed his raft into the water. I was right behind Benson in the boat. Since it was easier to launch on my own, the hippos had been watching us for a while now, and as we hit the water they began to make some noise and shift around. None of them really went anywhere, though, so I decided just to keep an eye on them and press on. I had my rifle with me, just in case, so if anything went sideways, I would at least have some sort of protection. Not that it would do much against these monstrosities. As Benson and I started paddling hard toward the rocks and the tree, there was a lot of honking and crying from behind us. I turned to see that the wildebeest and zebras had started to arrive past the bushes, but were keeping their distance clearly put off by us. I was really hoping that we could have gotten this done before they arrived, because there was even less of a chance of them crossing now, and that they had spotted humans moving around and being active, but we could worry about that later. Right now, we were steady, out on the water, and trying to make sure we finished what we started. We were about halfway to our destination at the midpoint of the river when I saw and heard splashes downstream. It sounded like something was moving. Immediately, I dropped my paddle and whipped my rifle around in that direction. You saw that, right? I asked Benson. I started getting scared. The water is this monster's element. Yeah, bro, I think this might be it, he said, and I was really, really hoping against that he was wrong. But of course, we weren't going to be so lucky. The water began to ripple as whatever had began to move was coming toward us, and although we couldn't see it, Benson and I opened onto it. There's a big difference between your instincts and your fear telling you something, but I know for myself in that instance, it was truly my instincts telling me that this was the Dagonek. I must tell both my and Benson's side of the story at the same time here, so bear with me. Our initial long-distance shots must have landed because a moment later the green, gray back of the cryptid came up above the surface for a split second, and I saw parts of its scaly hide chip away. Before it disappeared again, my boat was probably about three to five feet apart from Benson's raft at this point, and it was a very good thing that we weren't closer because of what happens next. As the Dagonex emerged again, I saw its huge, dark shadow dart through the water very quickly. 
I later realized that this may have been it pushing from the riverbed to gain speed, much like a hippo. The speed caught me by surprise and I lost my aim on it. This was a big problem, because that was when it closed in right on top of us. The Dagonek swam right between the raft and the boat, and I almost lost my balance as it knocked into my vessel, coming close to capsizing it. I had gotten lucky, but Benson was not so much, because the Dagonek hit his raft much harder, knocking it up and almost completely out of the water. This rattled Benson, and he fell backwards, but still maintained to hold his gun. The Dagonek surged to the surface, rearing up on its tail like a gigantic crocodile, saber teeth and claws bared as probably around 15 feet of it stood up above the river in a spray of water. It made a hissing rattle as it emerged and it stayed in its reared up position for just long enough for Benson and I both to be able to hit it squarely, I think in its neck, which means it must have gotten hit in the chest because blood sprayed from the whitish yellow scales lining both places as our rounds bit into the cryptid. The Dagonek reeled back with a squealing shriek and didn't smash down forwards and right on top of Benson as it probably intended to do, instead it fell more to the side and collapsed into the water near Benson's raft at an angle. Part of the monster's body, maybe a leg, hit the raft as it came down, and this time it was enough to flip Benson over the side and into the water. I could see and hear Benton splashing, obviously, but the Dagonek seemed to have vanished beneath the surface. Blood began to turn the water red, and even though I wasn't sure if we had killed the Dagonek, we certainly heard it, potentially enough to drive it off. I made the call to put my gun down and grab the paddle, rowing ferociously towards Benson. He was trying to grab the edge of the raft, grabbing for the ropes that lined its side, and just before I got there, he managed to grip one, able to keep his head above water now. I was a little less worried, and as I got closer, I stretched out my paddle to him. He was able to get a hold of it, and together, we pulled him up into the boat, breathing hard but relieved. Are you okay? I asked him. He was obviously completely drenched and he didn't look injured. I'm fine. I lost my gun. Where's the Dagonek? He answered. I don't know. Can you paddle? I asked him. He said yes, so I gave him the paddle and told him to take us back upstream to assess the situation. We had drifted away down the river but we got back near the crossing site quickly. I'm grateful to Benson for paddling even after such a shock, and all the while I was on the lookout with my rifle. As we approached, I started seeing more blood in the water, and I was starting to wonder if the Dagonek had died underwater and somehow sunk into the bottom. That was part of why we had been forced to kill it rather than tranquilize it and relocate it. If we tranked it and it went under, then it could drown, which would be a horrific and tragic circumstance. If we really had to kill it, the least we could do was try to do it as humanely as possible within our means. Turns out my fears were incorrect, though, because a moment later we saw Dagonek haul itself out of the water onto the bank opposite the one we were on. I tried to scramble up the side of the steep embankment, and I let out multiple shots loosely, and it hissed and tumbled back into the water. Benson started paddling hard to get after it, but that's when our friends the hippos took matters into their own hands. You see, when the shooting had started, the hippos had apparently all taken to the water and down to the bottom of the river. And they were still there because from a distance, we suddenly saw the water go wild, frothing and splashing as the Dagonek swam right into the hippos in its panicked escape. I must imagine that the hippos were taking revenge for their people, because it seemed certain that the Dagonek had killed some of their kind before. But now it was severely wounded and caught in the middle of eight angry ones, and it didn't last long. The hippos made an unholy amount of grunting, honking, wheezing, and squealing, and it looked like some of them were running away. But the pandemonium lasted for what could have been only a minute or two. When it was over, we saw multiple hippos come back onto land, and we could count the rest that were still in the water. One of the ones on land, a big male, was bloodied, but I honestly couldn't tell if it was his own blood or the Dagonex. Whatever the case, there wasn't much, so if he was injured, then it was probably minor. As for the Dagonek, there was no sign, and I just think that its body got pushed down into the mud, being stomped or crushed or bitten to death by hippos. Oh my god, bro, we gotta get out of here, Benson said as we watched the hippos, a statement which I very much agreed with. The hippos were riled up and might come our way at any moment, and we had interrupted a few hundred zebras and wildebeest from their plans that day. Yeah, let's get out of here, I agreed. 
Even though I probably used a much more, uh, stronger phrasing than that. The wind picked up as we both grabbed paddles and started heading to the shore. People think of Africa as being hot, and it certainly can be, but on the open savanna there's very little to block the wind, so it can get very chilly very fast, especially at nighttime. Being on the water didn't help this much, and I had also splashed quite a bit, so we were both soaking wet, not to mention poor Benson. So I know he was suffering even worse. Thankfully, it didn't take us long to get back to the jeep, and we were both able to change into some dry clothes. So that was Operation Scale, and it was a rousing success. If I do say so myself, even if some helpful hippos had stepped in to finish the job, many native people, including myself, and especially the older generations, often know animals as our four-legged brothers and sisters, and sometimes it's nice to talk out loud to those brothers and sisters too, just to tell them that you're passing through to ask them to let you by, or so on. So on that occasion, I made sure to give the hippos a heartfelt verbal thank you, both for dealing with the Dagonek and for leaving us in peace. The ones on land were just standing and staring at us, and for the ones in the water, I could, couldn't really see them, honestly, but if they could make human expressions. I imagine they looked smug right about then, and if they had hands, they probably would have been dusting them. I didn't say too much, in case I would upset them more. So after the calm thank you, I got back to paddling the boat. We left the Mara behind, and although I was grateful, that didn't stop me from going back with Heather as soon as she'd recovered so that we could watch the migration, with a much drier Benson as our safari guide. There are many big cities in Africa, like Nairobi, or Cairo, and Lagos, but I love being out in the bush, and I was very thankful for the opportunity to experience that. This was also after our experience with the Amelatuka, so it was interesting to have another giant reptile encounter on the continent. Anyways, that's about it. This letter is quite long, but you guys seem to enjoy the big ones. Hopefully, you felt good about this one as well. I know it took me longer than usual to get to it, but I do my best. It'll probably be a similar time frame for me to get the following letter to you, which will likely be the last. It was a bizarre and intense experience with a volcano and multiple different cryptids, so I wanted to tell you guys about it. So that'll be coming down the pipe sometime very soon. Anyways, stay safe out there. Be sure to keep your health up, because health is more important to you than any problem a cryptid can cause. And as sad as it may be to leave you all, I am looking forward to telling you one last story, and I am grateful you have been letting me share all of these others. But I'll have the sappy, emotional stuff for the grand finale in the next one. We'll talk more soon. This has been Sam White Owl, signing out.